welcome to our very last video notes for ancient Egypt. Wow, I can't believe we're done already. We're gonna be moving on to India soon. We can't wait to see what you guys like and um, enjoy about that. But for now, let's go ahead and finish up India nice and strong. Now, today in lesson four, we're actually going to be looking at a place called Kush. This is a kingdom that was just south of Egypt. And it's, I always like to say they're kind of like Egypt's annoying little brother or sister in that they grow up and you have a great relationship with them, but there's a lot of conflict sometimes too. Okay, so we're going to look at how Egypt and Kush kind of work together, but also had conflict sometimes. And it matters because the kingdoms of Nubia and Kush were influenced by Egyptian culture, and they also con continued many Egyptian traditions. Now, let's talk about the Nubians first. Nubia is a region, okay? So I'm going to grab my little pin out here. There we go. Nubia is a region, kind of like North America or the Southwest is a region. So it's this region south of the cataracts of Egypt. So it's south of uh, um, Upper Egypt. And it's divided up into the same thing here along the Nile, okay? We've got Upper Nubia in the south and Lower Nubia in the north. And for the same reasons, that elevation. So we're talking about an area just south of Egypt. And Nubia is the region. There's several different kingdoms that arose in this region. Kind of like in Mesopotamia, how we had the Sumerians and the Babylonians and the Assyrians. The Nubians are a group of people who live in a region. And we're going to see several different kingdoms that arise in this region. And we're looking towards the end of the old kingdom. So past our periods of time when Egypt was at its most powerful, we're gonna see Egypt starting to decline as people from this region and others start to become more powerful along the Nile. So let's take a look and compare and contrast the two regions of Nubia and Egypt, because although they both are along the Nile River, there are some major differences and those differences affect the culture and lifestyle of the people who live there. So, for example, for the lands in Nubia, we have savannas, these large grasslands, okay? Lots of wild animals, rain, very more dry. But remember, in Egypt, though, we had the desert lands and the river valleys. So, in Egypt, we have more of just right along the river and then desert on either side. In Nubia, the main water source is rainfall. Okay, along those savannas, kind of like we get today, those big rain clouds that'll just come and dump a whole lot of rain at once. But we know in Egypt, the Nile River was the main source of rain. It doesn't rain much in Egypt. Most of the water is from the Nile. So we see here a gentleman who is using his shadoof, this weighted pole with a bucket on the end, and he would dip that in and get the water out to irrigate the crops. Because of these different kinds of water that we're able to get and the frequency that we're able to get that water with, we have different sorts of crops as well. So in the region of Nubia, we have beans, yams, rice, grains, all sorts of tasty stuff. So these are yams, if you're not familiar with it, kind of looks a little bit like a sweet potato. Um, so it grows underneath the ground. But in Egypt, we had more of the grain crops. It's a lot easier to get a surplus with grain crops like wheat, rice, or some other vegetables and that huge variety of crops that we've talked about in Egypt. So here's wheat and we know we can make bread and all sorts of things from wheat. So the land had a lot of similarities, but there were some major differences in the way that Nubia and Egypt got their resources and especially their food and the way they got water as well. And we know that that geography, that's that G23 standard again, that geography will impact how people live. So the first kingdom that we see um, coming up in Nubia, and we see Nubia back here, isn't it beautiful, is the kingdom of Kerma. So just like in Mesopotamia and Egypt, we had smaller city-states, and eventually they conquered weaker ones. And that led to the kingdom of Kerma being formed. So here we are, here's our Nile River, and here is kind of the capital of Kerma, and they controlled this large area there. 
Kerma and Egypt develop a trading relationship. And this led to something called cultural diffusion. Guys, this is a super important term. I want you to star it, circle it, box it in, put some clouds around it. This is one of the most important terms that we're going to learn all year. Ms. Todrick is geeking out. Circle this on yours. Big deal. Okay. Cultural diffusion is when we have two or more cultures coming together and blending to create something new. So in this case, we have people from the Nubian region of Kerma and Egypt bringing their food, their ideas together and creating something new. Cultural diffusion is a huge part of our own culture. For example, today I had Mexican food for lunch. It was delicious. My family isn't originally from Mexico, but Mexican immigrants brought their food traditions to America and people decided it was delicious and it spread all over. It diffused. Same thing with everything from technology. This microphone made in Japan. OK, um, to entertainment. You, maybe you like to watch anime cartoons, um, which are from Japan originally as well to the food we eat and the clothes we wear can all be traced back to cultural diffusion. So when the kingdom of Kerma and Egypt did this, they shared ideas and they spread and kind of mixed together. Now, Egyptian armies invaded this region of Nubia in the 1400s BC and ruled for 700 years. So they became kind of the ones in charge, okay? And this is our new kingdom. So this is the period of time when we've been talking about with Ramesses and Hatshepsut, okay? And they conquer all the way down in along Nubia and up into the Middle East. Now, because Egypt is the one doing the conquering, um, the Nubians start to adapt more Egyptian beliefs and customs, okay? So imagine tug of rope, okay? So if culture is the thing being pulled, and the Egyptians are winning, the Nubians are going to be more on the Egyptian side. So they're going to pick up more of that quote unquote stronger cultures, beliefs and customs. So we start to see that in the art that the Nubians make during this time. We start to see that in the architecture, like the temples they're building, as well as um, in their written records, they even start using hieroglyphics like the Egyptians do. And they add their own little spin on it, but we see that Egyptian influence. And so, for example, they even started building pyramids. Now, you'll notice these pyramids are tall and skinny. They are different than the Egyptian pyramids, but we can still see that the Egyptians influenced it. Okay, so the trend or the idea takes on a life of its own when it comes to Nubia. And the Nubians change it just a little bit, but the um, base idea is the same. Now, let's look at the next kingdom that arose in this region of Nubia, Kush. In 850 BC, the Nubians finally take advantage of Egyptians starting to become a little bit weaker, and they form an independent kingdom known as Kush. Okay, so again, we're down here below that first cataract. And they're right along the Nile River, and there's several cities there. Um, and in 750 BC, after about 100 years, the Kushite kings start realizing Egypt is going through a period of turmoil. That means there's a lot of stress. Things aren't going well in Egypt. So they decide this is a great time to invade because we know our enemies are always watching. And Egypt was divided. Remember, united we stand, divided we fall. So they watched Egypt fighting and bickering among themselves and decided this would be a great time to invade. So they managed to come in, these Nubian kings, and come all the way up to Thebes in Egypt. So all of Upper Egypt now belongs to Nubia by 750 B.C. By 728 BC, oops, King Pai of Nubia completes the conquest of Egypt and starts the 25th dynasty. So now the tables have turned. For a long time, the Egyptians were ruled, or the Egyptians ruled Nubia, and now 
It's flipped. It's like when your little brother finally gets taller than you and you can't pick on him anymore. So we see the Nubians taking over this whole area along the Nile. Now they're still using a lot of Egyptian culture and they wanna make sure that the people who live in Egypt accept them. So they take bits of Egyptian culture and bits of Kushite culture, that's what we call people from Kush, Kushites, and they blend it together. So we start to see on um, tomb art, on records and all of this, um, Egyptian culture, but with a very distinctly African flair. Um, in the early days, Egypt took a lot of its culture from Mesopotamia. But now, with the, with the Kushites taking over, they're taking a lot of their culture from other parts in South or in Southern Africa. So we start to see, for example, paintings of pharaohs with much darker skin um, coming in from the South with these Kushites. Okay, so it's that cultural diffusion again. Now, in 671 BC, unfortunately, this Kushite kingdom didn't last long, the Assyrians invade Egypt. And we talked about the Assyrians when we talked about Mesopotamia, because they took over a huge empire, and they had those chariots, okay, um, that came over with strong, powerful weapons, and they defeat the Kushites. So now Egypt is under the control, Egypt and Nubia are under the control of a group from Mesopotamia. By 540 BC, Cush's rulers decide we are going to um, pull back a little bit. We don't want to be part of the Assyrian Empire anymore. So they move their capital to Meroe, which is a city back down in the south near the Nile. Now, so they've separated themselves from the Akkadians and from Egypt a little bit. They're just going to kind of focus back at the home base. And they have an abundance of natural resources here. We're right along the Nile, so it makes it a good trading city. So we see again those pyramids, and for a while, Kush becomes powerful again. But by AD 350, so this is about 700 years, we're switching over to that other side of the timeline, we see another kingdom arise, Axum. Now, Axum is... Oops, eraser, there we go. Axum is over here near the coast of the Red Sea. So now, instead of invaders coming from the north or from Mesopotamia, we have invaders coming up to Meroe, okay? So those armies came in and destroyed Meroe. Now, at the same time, we've got the Greeks and the Romans coming in and fighting over northern um, Egypt. So we're going to see when we get to Greece and Rome how that area was controlled by the Greeks and the Romans later on. But this all goes back to this idea of empires rising and falling and the fact that our enemies are always watching. Okay, they're always looking for that weakness. Now, I want you to think about this hot question. In what way could the relationship between the Nubians in the Kingdom of Kush, that region to the south of Egypt, and the Egyptians be compared to the relationship between a younger and older sibling? Okay, so if you have siblings, think about how the power shifts and changes as you guys get older and as time progresses. For example, when, I, when my sisters and I were young, I was always taller than them. But as we got older, now one of my sisters is about mm, six inches taller than me, okay? So she's a lot bigger than I am now. How could that change the power dynamic? And how does that relate to the Nubians and the Egyptians? Now, after you get done writing this hot question, don't go away, because I have one more pun for you here. Remember, I'm looking for you to be writing down those puns, and this one's a good one, okay? All right, guys, I'm gonna be completely honest with you. I've tried to record this slide like four times and I keep screwing it up. So this is gonna be the last time I record it. If I screw it up, I screw it up. It's fine, life is not perfect. Sometimes we just have to be happy with what we can get done. It's okay. Anyways, so here's our very last pun of ancient Egypt. Well, at least for in, in our video notes, you know I'm gonna have more in class. That's just how I roll. It's Ms. Todrick. 
welcome to the world all right so what were comic books written in in ancient egypt hieroglyphics it's so great. I'm going to even spell it for you. Ready? Hero Glyphics. <laughs> All right, guys. Thank you for putting up with me and my crazy puns. You guys know I love them. And you know I love you. Have a fantastic day. Make good choices. I love you. Talk to you later. Bye.